the question should not have been where was God, but where was mankind? Good evening, it's June 2nd. I'm Arno Grunberg, an author and welcome in the Bali. Also to those of you who are watching this from their homes, their bathrooms, their swimming pools or their saunas. Today, uh, this event is basically on the occasion of the Dutch publication of Philip Müller's book, Zonderbehandlung, Three Years in the Gas Chamber. Because of this, I will talk with uh, Piotr Szewinski. Piotr Szewinski is a Polish historian and since 2006, the director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. Born in 1972 in Warsaw, Poland, Chavinsky has dedicated his career to preserving the memory of the Holocaust and promoting education about the crimes committed at Auschwitz. He's the author of numerous books and articles about the Holocaust and memorials. In his publications, he also addresses contemporary issue, issues related to racism, racism anti-Semitism and human rights, drawing connections between the past and the present. In his role as director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, he has focused on maintaining the authenticity of the camp's structures, artifacts, and archives, ensuring that future generations can learn from the Holocaust. About the role of the museum, Chavinsky stated, our moral obligation, the reason for this place, is to warn, to warn man of himself. Before we start, I'd like to ask you something about where you live because you live partly in Warsaw, but also you live in Auschwitz, in the camp itself. And about this, you wrote something in um, your book Epitaph, um, which really surprised me. You write, once you set Auschwitz straight in your mind, if you not so much live with it as because of it, then there's no turning back. Nothing will cut it out of my conscience, even if I change jobs. Apart from exceptional cases and those who run away very fast, after barely a few months, generally one never leaves Auschwitz. When you are involved in Auschwitz, deeply involved, that means that you are going there nearly every day. You are working only in this place. You are working with this place. You are explaining that place. You are discussing it. It's happened less and less, but with survivors, we are... Uh, I don't know, discussing with, with young people, new generations. Uh, it starts to be not only an enormous part of yourself, but also a sort of lens to, 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 to see the, the today's world also, the, the today's, let's say, drama, the today's, I don't know, uh, tasks, the today's dangers that you, you, you can feel. Uh, you know, that's not curricula that you have to, f to follow what you, what you can be after, after 17 years of, of, of serving as, as a director of Auschwitz. It's something more than a job. It, 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 I understand that that's like a sort of mi mission. And when I started to, 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 to work in, in Auschwitz, you know, one of the drivers of the museum was coming to me and he said, you know, Mr. Director, I could certainly earn more money two times or three times more money if I will be a driver on some big uh, tiers, you know, uh, uh, around Europe. Uh, so I, I could be a driver somewhere else, but I will never be the same driver that I am here. So if a driver understands this, you can imagine how... Uh, it is for a director. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Maybe we can, let's have a close, there's a picture of Auschwitz in your book, maybe you can see it. And then... It's maybe good, I would say it's good to explain to the audience the differences, and maybe you can do that, hopefully, uh, between Auschwitz I, the Stammlager, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, where most of the guessings took place, and then Auschwitz III, where the uh, satellite camps were, Monowitz, among them, where Primo Levi worked. So what, what exactly do we see here? So here you see the, 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 the western part of, uh, of the city of Oświęcim, and the village of Brzezinka, with between the two places you have a railroad, probably one of the reasons of the implementation of the camp at that, at that place, because it was very well connected with uh, the entire, let's say, central or eastern uh, Europe. Uh, at the top, uh, on your left, 
you see uh, some very similar buildings. This is Auschwitz I, uh, built on the basis of a, of a pre-war military chasm. Some bigger buildings, a little bit on the right, there are some factories, German factories that were implemented in this site since 1941, uh, 42 mainly, uh, to use the, the work of the, of, the, of the prisoners. And on the right, when the sun is coming, you see the enormous place of, of Birkenau, starting to be built, let's say, some two years after, after the, the beginning of Auschwitz I. You don't see Monowice, who is the, three or four kilometers uh, to the east, and you don't see, of course, uh, 49 or 50 subcamps that were surrounding all the, all the area. In this part of Birkenau, completely at the west, surrounding by some trees, you have the most important ruins of the crematoria in gas chambers number two, three, four, and five. Just remind us, how many people were killed in Auschwitz? You know, we are, uh, let's say, certainly not less than 1,100,000, and certainly not more than 1,300,000. But because uh, Germans do not count every transport at the arrival, historians are not able to give a more precise Yes, someone were giving some more precise, but it's still discussed by, by, by historians because uh, and 90 percent probably of the archives of the camps was destroyed at that time. So we are still in the philosophy of a reconstruction of, 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 the, of the factography, of the history, of the big numbers of, of all those history. Uh, the transports coming from the Western Europe, like from here or from France or from Belgium, they were counted. Uh, as a starting point in Mehelen or in uh, at Rancy, in some other place. And we have the archives from those places. But transports were, that were coming from Poland, from Hungary, from, uh, from Slovakia, from, even from Ukraine, the western part of Ukraine, they were never e even counted. So, so, so there are not registers of those transports name by name. Yeah. And about you, in one of your books, um, I think it's in, in uh, Auschwitz, a monograph on the human, you uh, mentioned that uh, 70,000 people worked there. No, no not, not in Auschwitz. 70,000, uh, it's a number of SS who are working on the whole system of the camps. 70,000. In Auschwitz, that was a different period, let's say. It was it started with a small group of 1,000 of SS in, in 40, and it ended perhaps in... In, uh, in summer 44, some 4,000, 4,500, uh, at least close to 10,000 SS were going through, let's say, uh, Auschwitz, a different period, of course. But 70,000 is a number that uh, were working in, in the whole system of camps. And what is very interesting is that among those 70,000, 1,650 or something like this were sentenced after the war. And the clear majority received two, three years of prison, not more. So in order to kill more than a million people, you just you need 10,000 perpetrators? Even less, I think. Even less. Even less, because many of them have got some, uh, so, so, some different roles, let's say. To the really machine of the, of the, of the killing people, it was, it was not a very big yeah. group. F to those who don't know exactly what is on the commando is, could you explain? Yeah. Southern Commando, a special commando if you prefer, uh, it was a group of prisoners, a different numbers uh, in different moments of course, uh, that were obliged to first of all help, excuse me the word, uh, those who will be killed to take out uh, all, the, all the clothes, to make them enter, to encourage them to, to, to enter to the, to the gas chambers, uh, after to pick up those clothes and to take them out, uh, and after the, the Cyclone B was injected and after the, the, those people were killed, they have to take those bodies to cut the hairs to the woman, to take the 
teeth uh, in gold to, to take all the bijoux that uh, can remain uh, on, on those people and to burn them. For that, they were separated from the others um, prisoners in the camp. They received a little bit better uh, things to, to eat they, they, because they were in a, in, a, in a very critical, let's say, uh, psychological situation. They were shocked, as, as Philip explained it. It, it, it was a, for them, it, they were feeling that they are somewhere else between the life and the dead without knowing where they are, really. Uh, so they received some a little bit better conditions. Uh, however, it was for them absolutely impossible to go back to some other work in the camp. Philip Miller, it was an exception. He arrived during a short time to be in, in Monowitz, but in general it was impossible. And they were thinking, and I think they were right, that they were their destiny is, is to be executed uh, at the end of this work in order to. To, 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 to keep the secret about, That's about all the taken. Yeah. yeah. So it was one of the commando in the camp. Every prisoner has to work in a commando, but certainly the, the, the most critical, the most tragical, the most uh, uh, terrific one. And they knew that, of course, they can commit a suicide, for example, but it will not change anything because they will take another one. directly another one and. Uh, yeah, so their situation was, was very critical. And they did uh, 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 um, uh, insurrection, sort of revolt uh, in, in, in 44. Some of them, two of those four uh, crematoria in, in Birkenau, uh, they were all killed. But among those two others that did not participate for, for different reasons in this, in this, uh, uh, in this revolt, um, some one, nearly of, uh, close to 100, I think 96 arrived to the end of the camp, that mm. means to the evacuation, to the, to the march of the dead. 96 of 96 the almost 2,200 so members of the Zonderkommando, correct? 96 arrived yeah. to the... To the survived, to, yeah. so survived until the, the, until the, the dead march. Yeah. Uh, we are not sure about the, the final results because uh, we are in, in January 45. The end of the war is in May. They arrived to Austria, to, to some camps in Germany. Yeah. Uh, they were in a little bit in a better condition because they received a better food in Auschwitz. But uh, so probably many of them survive if something tragical didn't happen. But only, only a few of them uh, wrote their memories yeah. after the war. I remember three books, I think three, and one book with uh, collections of some uh, 10 or 12 interviews. I think that's all. Primo Levi, as you know, um, argued that the most demonic crime of the Third Reich, of the Nazis, was the um, existence, was the creation of the Sonderkommandos. And he wrote that was an attempt to shift onto others specifically the victims, the burden of guilt, so that they were deprived even of the, the solace of innocence. Would you agree with Primo Levi that this was the most, that the Sonderkommando was the, was the most demonic part of the whole endeavor, of the whole killing machine of the Nazis? I don't know. I think we have to, to replace the, the words of, of, of Primo Levi on, on a very long discussion about Sonderkommando after the war starting with some very critical and very, uh, I, I think, too critical judgment of, of, of uh, Hannah Arendt, for example, or, or some others, who, who treated them like a quite co-responsible uh, of those killings. That was completely false. Let's say, they didn't kill, they, they were obliged to do this work, uh, as in some other commandos, some others were obliged to do some other works. There were people who were helping uh, Josef Mengele, for example, in some other part of Auschwitz, uh, because they were doctors and they were obliged to help him. You know, uh, there were capos, there were some other prisoners who also did, did some terrific things because they were ob obliged. So I think that in those words of Primo Levi, I, I hear a little bit this discussion of, of the past decades about, about let's say, a sort of, of judgment not only of the situation of the Sonderkommando, but also on their 
let's say, involvement. That is, for me, a, a perspective that we have to avoid, to, 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 to avoid and to let for the, yeah. the past decades. Yeah. I think now the understanding after those three books and those interviews yeah. of the Sondra Commander is completely different and, and certainly more approach of the reality. Yes, it was an infernal part of Auschwitz, perhaps the most infernal, but it was not the most, let's say, it, it was not, let's say, something that, from the moral point of view, engaged the people yeah. of the Sonderkommando. In the monograph, you quote an author that's um, very dear to me, Tadeusz Borowski. And you quote him, the quote goes, that's a camp law. People going to their death must be deceived to the very end. That's the only permissible form of charity. And in your other book, you explain a bit how the deception works, that the deception had two allies. The first was the system that the victims, mostly Jews, were traveling with their families. And this prevented with the elderly and the children, and this prevented the able, capable young men and women to, um, to resist. Or to jump from the train. Or to jump from you the train. You can't lose. Uh, let let, let your, your, your kids, you know, in, in a train uh, uh, and save yourself. It was, it was something that was really organized like this for, the, for that reason. There was a few escape from the trains, in fact. Because people were traveling with the family. In general, yes. In so general, there were yes. some transport, uh, some different transport, but in general, yes, the, 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 the rule was, yes, by family. Yeah. And many of those who survived explained after in their testimonies that they were thinking how to escape of this train, but they can't lose the old parents or the small kids in, in the train alone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the second alien you mentioned is hope. So much that us in Philip Miller's write in his book that even the, the the victims in the family camp, the so-called family camp part of Auschwitz, mainly they came from the other concentration camp to Eisenstadt. When the moment when they were told that they were that they were going to be terminated, that they were going to be killed, even in Auschwitz, where they've been for where they've been for several months, maybe even longer, they couldn't, they wouldn't believe it. They said, "No, they're not going to kill us. We were promised. The SS promised us work, another life." So even, can you explain what what even in our life when we are facing some danger, we are immediately uh, looking for some hope. And we prefer this hope, because this hope brings us, let's say, some perhaps positive uh, solution. So, so we are searching for this hope, and we are, we are, we are really uh, catching it very, very, very strongly. So in this extreme danger, in this situation of uh, everything is done by running, everything is too quick, everything is ununderstandable, everything is unclear, everything is uh, dangerous, let's say it was enough to give some very, very small pieces of hope from time to time. For example, to put on the uh, railway rampa uh, a car with a clear sign of the Red Cross. Ah, many of them were thinking like this. There is a Red Cross here. So perhaps they were right. We were going to work somewhere. Or if, if not, why, what? why the Red Cross will, will do that, that, uh, in that place? Uh, or, you know, uh, before the entrance to the gas chambers, telling to all those transports, um, put well your shoes together in order to find them quickly after you're going to take your bath. Or to give them some small pieces of uh, middle. Soap. 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 You know, because they are supposed to go for a bath. You know, and, and some small pieces, uh, pieces of, of hope in this critical, very stressive, very anxious situation were more, let's say, credible for those people uh, than, the reality. than the reality that you can analyze, but, uh, but, but you want this hope, so, so you choose this hope. Uh, yes, the hope was one of the methods. So if you want to deceive people, just give them hope? No, it's not even... If you don't let them any hope, they will revolt, they will fight. Only then? Only of course, then. if you look at Treblinka, at, uh, at Sobibor, 
or in the history of the Sonder Commando, yeah. the, 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 the big fights, the big revolts started uh, when there was no, no hope, hope, when yeah. the transport stopped uh, at the end. They understood that they would be killed soon because they saw too much. So at that moment, yes, yes. the fight arrived. Yeah. A fight not to... Even in a sense, the history of the Warsaw Ghetto is the same. It was not a, a choose of a liberty, but it, it was a choose of the way that you want to be killed, killed or, or, or that, to that die. That was the choice. Yeah. Yeah. And then you... Yeah. But of course, after the war, um, the hope disappeared. And here's a good example in your book again about the survival, how that worked. You quote, a quote from a book by Harel, my neighbor, Mrs. Kodesh, had arrived there from Wilno with her 15-year-old son. When she saw the children being directed to the left, she, had, she advised them, go with the children. They will probably get a glass of milk. Then in Israel, on the day of her only son's birthday, she took a load of pills. She was 40. She was unable to forgive herself for sending him to die. It was a quite common experience for those, especially mothers, because there's a kids uh, under 14 was standing in the column of mothers and, and children at the selection. And if at the last moment they got the kid to, 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 to the grandmother or to some, somebody else, or, or they, they have to convince the kid to go in, uh, in, in the, let's say, false directions, they cannot uh, forget themselves uh, to, 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 to do that. Many of them committed suicide in the, in the few years after the war, many. We spoke already a bit about, of course, the uprising of the Zonderkommando in the fall of 44, but Müller writes, and this was just one example, often also about small, smaller acts of resistance inside or just before the gas chambers. And there's another example that I like you, that like, I, I, I would like to read. It's just a very small part out from the book um, of Müller. A little old man, and we are now in the gas chambers, a little old man had begun to pray the vidu. First he bent forward, then he lifted his head and arms to the sky to beat his chest with his fist every loud and passionate sentence, utter, sentence uttered. Hebrew words echoed across the courtyard. Ashamnu, we are guilty, Bagatnu, we have been unfaithful, Gazalnu, we have harmed our neighbors, Dibanu, Dofi, Dofi, we have spoken slander, here we know, we have acted wrongly, we are shainu, we have committed transgressions, Yaatsnu, we have done evil intentionally, Hamasnu, we have committed violence. My God, before I was created, I was nothing, and now, now that I'm created, it's as if I were not created. Thus I am in life, so much more in death, I will praise you eternally, Lord, eternal God, Amen, Amen. The crowd of 2000 had repeated each of these words in many voices, though perhaps not everyone understood the meaning of this Old Testament confession of sin. Most had kept themselves under control until then, but now tears were running down the cheeks of almost everyone. Deeply poignant scenes unfolded. They weren't just tears of despair. The people placed their faith in God's hands and were in a state of religious ecstasy. Yes, it's happened uh, many times, uh, some reactions like this. If we, if we uh, read especially some testimonies of Salman Gradovsky, who was one of the Sonder Commando, he was coming from the southern Lithuania, if I remember well, and uh, he didn't survive the camp. He, he was one of the chief of this uh, revolt of Sonder Commando. Uh, he, he was killed, but before, he was able to, to put some uh, quite important part of literature of, of the camp, uh, some, some, uh, uh, some two or three, let's say, uh, part of, of, of his remarks, of his, his observation of... I, 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 I even don't know how, how, to, no. how, how to call it, let's say, in the ground. And no. it was uh, discovered after the war. Uh, Salman Gradovsky, and, and, and he, he, he was a religious uh, Jew, and it was certainly very difficult for all the religious Jews to, to see what happened in Auschwitz. It was, let's say, more, I don't want to say more easy, but more 
according to the religion, to be prepared to be killed for those who were directly put in the gas chambers, and for the others who, uh, who, who were observing during, during weeks and months something that was absolutely, uh, uh, you even didn't know how to act as a religious Jew. You didn't even know how it is possible, where is God, and how, let's say, z z those things can happen in, in, in the earth. Uh, and this is a little bit the tragedy that, that Gradowski is describing, and describing, and, and, and inside many times, he, 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 two or three times, he, he, he's speaking about those, uh, yes, those reactions of, uh, of those who, at the entrance of the gas chambers, or, or even inside, understood very well that this is the, the, the last moment, and they, 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 they have some some common religious prayers, some, some, yeah. some sort of... But of course, here, uh, not all the 2,000, 2000 dimensions, I believe, <coughs> were all religious. That Meaning, the, could, would, would you say, would you agree that, that to me this was also like an, an act of resistance? You know, when you, when you realize that you are at the end of, of your life, I think at this special moment, many people become religious uh, in every religion. Uh, you, you are, you know, at the end of something. Once again, the hope indicates you that, that it must be something after. So uh, yes, but it was like this. You know, those people were starting from different part of Europe. Uh, maybe the North Hungarian, the Slovakian, the, the, the Polish Jew. They have some some suspicions about Auschwitz. They, they, they especially in '44. Like, yes, they, they have some some some. Let's say. Uh, rumors for Jews coming from Saloniki, for example, or, or from France. They were told that they would be evacuated in the East in order to rebuild their life somewhere. Uh, and you know, every time this propaganda was functioning, even if the transport was extremely difficult, even if some people died in this transport uh, because there's uh, starvation or, or lack of water or everything, uh, at the arrival, they said, OK, now those who are able to work, they will be okay. separated from the others. You will find yourself next Sunday. You know, OK, you know, they arrive. You have to take a bath because, yes, for hygienic reasons, after this long uh, transport, you have to, to go inside. OK, it's normal. Uh, and do, do that quickly because uh, the tea or the, or the soup uh, is waiting, waiting for you. At that moment, many of them was applauding. Because after three or four days without water, uh, hearing train, that, yeah. that, that there's a, a tea that is waiting for us, it, it, yes. But at the end, when they realize that they are going to this bath, women's and men's, this is strange. Huh? Maybe in our world today, so now less. <laughs> but imagine you 80 years ago huh? yeah. in, in the religious world. It started to be a little bit stranger. And in general, at the end, yeah. they understood that, yes. Yeah. How many manuscripts of, of Sonderkommandos were found after the war? Do you know that? Something like uh, between five and, and seven, I yeah. think, uh, yes. But the Gradowski, is, for me, is the most amazing one because really he, he's in discussion with God. Uh, being in discussion with himself and in a discussion with the humanity, he's in a very deep discussion with God. He do not contest God because he's religious, but he contests the moon. The moon, I know. The moon, yeah. yeah. Moon, where do you, why, why do you have the right to be upon us when something like this arrives? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's very poetic, it's, it's very moving. It's, it's, yes, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a sort of literature that I am unable to tell you what kind it is. It's something, a part of all the others, part of the literature of Radoski. Yeah. Yeah. There is in your book also, you mentioned now you mentioned God. Um, the Pope comes to Auschwitz. I think it's the former Pope, and he asks the old question, where was God? Benedict, then, yeah. Benedictus. And then a friend of yours, who is also a poet and a survivor, he gets very angry and upset about this question because he claims it's the wrong question. The question should not have been, where was God, but where was mankind? Yeah, and he left. He, he didn't stay until the end of the ceremony. He left. He was so upset, upset that he, he left, yeah. And what, what would have been your answer to your friend? 
Hmm? What would have been your answer to this question? No, I, 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 I think he was right. You know, uh, uh, to question God is a very, very easy way to escape about the question about humanity. It's exactly like today. Everybody asks me what we will do when the last survivor will disappear. This is a, one of the two most frequently asked questions to me. The second one is what to do for the new generation will come more uh, numerously uh, to see Auschwitz. This is, those two questions appear in every uh, interview, in every discussion with politicians, with uh, those two questions. So it's about the survivors and the next generations. And what is about us, about us in the middle of that? Nobody asks uh, how to do for the parents who would, would come uh, understand more visiting Auschwitz. No, no, this question did not appear any, any time. This is an escape question, of course, about the survivors and about the new generations. It's an escape. And the question of God is also an escape. To avoid the, mo the most painful questions. Yeah. Where I am in this history. Piotr, thank you for your conversation. Before we close, I'd like to thank you for being here, for listening. I'd like to mention the name of the Dutch translator who is sitting here in the first row. Um, that's Jan Sietzma. I think you did a terrific job. And I hope we'll see each other again. Thank you. Okay.